Thank you, Mas. Yeah. Thank you all for this invitation. I really appreciate to be here. I haven't been to San Carlos before, but uh, let me see that I was quite impressed by what I've already seen today. And it's a real pleasure to be, share, to be able to share with you some of our interest in chemistry. Uh, as you can see, I have not been born yesterday, but I'm still very enthusiastic about chemistry. And I hope you will share my enthusiasm for chemistry uh, in listening to this uh, lecture. Uh, most of the work that I'm going to describe has been done in this institute that you see there. It's an institute that I have uh, started with a colleague from France, and uh, which aims to bring together chemists and biologists in the same building. You know. And uh, we have essentially structural biology there, that means uh, essentially chemistry, physical chemistry, uh, all, all the X-ray and MR facilities and so on, but for the biologists as well. So we do a lot of protein structure, uh, DNA and so on. And then uh, we have organic chemistry in a broad sense, a lot of supramolecular chemistry in this institute, and uh, biology. And uh, hopefully, uh, that's what we aim at, uh, that presence of biologists and chemists who meet every day uh, in the various meeting rooms or in the bar of the institute, uh, they uh, should, seem that should stimulate, of course, collaboration between the two areas. I would like first to thank those people who really did the work. Uh, I didn't list here the names uh, of all the students and postdocs who worked on the different aspects uh, that I will discuss today, but you will see their name on the slides. Uh, we, of course, need colleagues, uh, what they call the rescuers. Uh, in this particular project, uh, they were essentially theoretical chemists. Some of them you may know, probably Ken Hogg is a familiar name to many of the organic chemists here. Uh, Jean Jodi, perhaps a little bit less because he's more specialized in the aspect of medicinal chemistry and uh, uh, chemical biology. My colleague Michel Laguerre, in particular, from the IECB. Also, the technical help of uh, this person that I mentioned here. But first, first of all, I have to think to thank the scientific board and my colleagues of the IECB because when I decided to retire from the directorship of the institute, that was my second retirement, by the way, uh, they invite me to stay as what I call a veteran postdoc. So uh, I think I'm probably quite proud to be the oldest postdoc, uh, still active in chemistry, maybe in the world, you know. So also we need money, and money was provided by the this different organization, and you see that industry was very generous with us, and we, I want to thank them. Okay, I'll start with a question. And the question is this. Is there still room for a chemistry-driven approach towards drug discovery? And uh, well, of course, everybody here, you are all chemists, and I'm pretty sure you would say, of course, yes. Well, let's see why. Well, we believe that small molecules, the molecules that we are making, uh, are known to interact with macromolecules, especially the macromolecules of living organisms, and they, have, they can have a very powerful effect on their functions. So they can be research tools to discover new biological macromolecules, and to study their functions. And this is becoming very important now with the development of the Human Genome Project because a lot of new targets will be available, which are still unknown. And of course, that's very important to, for the development of new therapeutic agents. And we know, of course, that small molecules have been shown to lead to a lot of very important therapeutic agents for the benefit of mankind. So this is very familiar to the chemist. But now, some other people, but sometimes also chemists, they often view that chemistry is merely a service technology, aiming at the product, 
production or the fast production because that's very important that's what I put quickly in blue here uh, enough structural variation for testing pharmacological properties what's important is to be able to make quickly a lot of molecules whatever molecules and that's very dangerous I have nothing against the word technology but that means also in the uh, when people talk about that that there is no more creativity uh, in this field for the chemist and I think that's wrong and one of the consequences of this attitude would be the following is that complex structures are often eliminated too early in the discovery process it's too difficult to make too expensive to make so we don't do it industry is very sensitive to this problem of course and I've heard that I've been consultant in many companies and I have always opposed to that attitude there are ways to solve these problems but they, they don't even look at other at possible solutions they just eliminate the project and many projects have been eliminated on a basis like this which is totally stupid also it could lead to inadequate structural diversity that is we don't cover because we limit ourselves to easy chemistry and there is many areas of the biological space biological descriptive uh, which are not explored and of course that very detrimental for the discovery of new uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and there is too little use of a small molecule for the discovery tools of biological targets these days uh, one of the reasons is that one needs phenotypic testing for this and they are not always available and some people are reluctant to uh, develop this test they think it's better to make uh, binding uh, testing and things like this so there are problems there if you eliminate chemistry from the discovery process now what I'm going to discuss today is one approach there are other approaches of course rational design for instance uh, but rational design needs of course the knowledge of the target but what we are going to discuss now is what natural product can provide uh, to us in terms of discovery of new drug of course you can always say well natural products are available I will collect them and they measure the biological activity and maybe if I collect enough of natural product I will find a new drug but that's not the way to do and what should remain remind that natural products remain a major source of human medicine around 50 percent of the approved drugs are natural products or natural product inspired or natural product derived molecules with some small modification, semi synthetic compounds. And this is particularly true for antibacterials and antitumorals. And there are some good reasons for that. Natural products are produced by enzymatic reaction in the plant, in the animal. And the chemical descriptor, therefore, should be optimal to modulate an area of biological interest. They belong to the family. They recognize each other. If the enzyme does not recognize the different intermediate leading to the natural product, there is no reaction. So, natural products also, they have some purpose for the producer. And the purpose is to interact with biological targets, whatever biological targets, often microbial, vegetal, but also animal. And this activity has been shaped and optimized by what I call environmental high throughput screening. So nature has been doing that for us. Now, they also can interact with higher organisms since protein domains are conserved and homologous structures are found in humans. So these molecules have structure which are very close in terms of chemical description to those which are the structure of the biological macromolecules and therefore they should allow for an entry into the discovery process 
at a much more advanced stage than does the screening of standard diversity libraries. You know, for years, industry has been tried to cover the chemical space by making, usually by standard reaction, but using, of course, all the, uh, uh, the, the tools and the technology to make a lot of compounds at the same time. That's combinatorial chemistry, as you know. And I remember these people saying, oh, this year we are able to make 300,000 new compounds. So what? The chemical space is much bigger than the biological space. And therefore, the chance to find something interesting is very small. It's a huge effort for nothing. And it's very clear, if you follow that a little bit, that has been extremely disappointing. Almost nothing came out of this. Well, if you think about natural products, you are already close to the biological descriptors. And therefore, the chance to find something interesting, something relevant, at least for the biological testing, uh, is uh, much higher. Also, Lipinski rules do not apply to natural products. So, pharmacoviability should be higher. And nature provides already now a highly diversified library of complex biologically relevant structure, therefore. But also, many of the natural products are still cryptic. You should keep that in mind. And many more structures will be discovered in the future, especially using the new technologies in the, in the, the genetic engineering. And the diversity and complexity of natural products makes them able to target biological macromolecules in a highly selective fashion. You need diversity, but also complexity. Okay, therefore, natural product structure should be considered as a unique source of inspiration for the design of molecules of therapeutic interest. They should be used as template. And if I show you that, I can you ask you the following question. Would you have designed these molecules? Of course, maybe it would be true for a very simple molecule, but not for all. So what is the strategy? Our strategy is first to select the natural product. That's the product we love, for reasons that I will discuss in a moment. But we are in love with this product. That's not going to be the final drug but it will be a source of inspiration to build molecules which have a chance to be useful as therapeutic agents. So the next step would be to design a scaffold, which should be more simple than a the natural product, but in particular, it should be rather easy to synthesize. Or we should make the synthesis easy if we don't have the methods. And that's what I call a privileged scaffold. It should retain essential elements thought to be responsible for the biological activity of the natural product, if this biological activity is known. The challenge is this. Try to find simple building blocks that you can either prepare very easily in important quantities, Combine this building block by a short sequence to make the privileged scaffold. So the challenge would be here, the challenge for the synthetic chemist. And then you get the scaffold which should carry enough functionalities which would allow to build a library of natural product analogs by very simple chemistry, straightforward chemistry, to make 100, 200 compounds related to the natural products. These compounds are all similar to the natural product, but you can notice they are all different. And that's a collection of the natural product analogs that I want to make. So it's another approach to drug discovery, which benefits from what nature is giving us, but that we modify in a way which allows 
an access, an easy access uh, to more interesting products. And so the different steps are the selection of the natural product. One criteria can be interesting biological profile. But I believe also in purely chemical criterion, like unusual structural feature. This class of compound is not very well represented in what we know in the data bank uh, of uh, products which have been tested and so on. It has a funny shape. It has uh, some interesting feature in the structure, some interesting functional group, whatever. As a chemist, of course, you will see, and I will show you that uh, in the different example, uh, we can probably uh, find out reasons to be interested in a specific structure. Now, when we have selected a natural product, sometimes we will know the biological activity, sometimes not. So we have to design a privileged scaffold. So at least it should keep the key structural feature. I don't speak about biological activity or responsible for biological activity. I just look as a chemist. There is a, an amide bond there. That amide bond is probably very important for hydrogen bonding. There is a carboxylic acid there. That's going to be perhaps very important. There is a stereo center there, which has a functional group, or maybe something hydrophobic there. I would like to have something hydrophobic in my scaffold as well. That's the kind of criterion that we will apply. And of course, you can do that with the help of modeling. And it should be accessible. If it's accessible by conventional method, I personally am not interested in, because I am a synthetic chemist. But of course, the medicinal chemist can be interested in that. He applies the chemistry of others, he makes his scaffold, and builds his library. As a synthetic chemist in university, we have to bring some creativity, and then we have to design now a new route or a new sequence of uh, uh, synthesis and implement, of course, in the lab, the synthesis of this uh, uh, privileged scaffold. Criterion. Short, not 65 steps, three, four, five. Productive, I don't need 0.1 milligram. I need 10 grams. Diastereo selective, I don't want to have mixture. So, diastereo selectivity is important. Enantio selectivity, not yet, because in many cases, I don't know which compound, which enantiomer is active. There are cases where I can guess because I have an allergy, but there are many cases I cannot guess. So we should make both. And then we can go for an enter-selective synthesis of identified hits. Okay. We have been following that strategy, which also uh, is followed by Herbert Waldmann, for instance, in Germany, or by Danishevsky, for instance, uh, to uh, cite uh, some of the most important people in the field. Uh, but there are many others now uh, in this uh, uh, strategy, type of strategy, uh, leading to uh, our discovery. Now, I will start with the natural product, which was uh, isolated, had been isolated at uh, Gif sur Rivette in Paris uh, by some colleagues and uh, it's called Razilinam. And you see, when I saw this molecule, it doesn't look so complicated, but I thought that's an interesting molecule because it has some interesting feature. First, let me show, well, extraction. Extraction, yield of extraction, you see, it's not very accessible. The quantity is really very, very small. It's a spindle toxin. It inhibits the depolarization of uh, microtubules, so it's a compound which has an activity similar to taxol, uh, or taxotere. And the so cytotoxicity it is in the range of uh, 0.5 micromolar. So that's not bad to start with. Now, should we make this compound? We knew from the work of my colleagues at GIF that the dihedral al angle around the two aromatic ring, so around this bond here, should be 90 degrees for an optimum uh, biological activity. So we have atropoisomerism here. And as you can see that better in this uh, 
representation, but uh, these are 90 degrees angle.